Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with uh, eager hearts and, and minds ready to receive uh, truth, content, things that will uh, get us thinking about the kingdom of God and what he wants to do here at Emmanuel and in the greater work here in the city of Rochester, New Hampshire. And we believe, Father, that you're still in the business of saving souls. And you've given us the task to present a message that can change a person's life for all eternity. And so what we're going to talk about, Lord, is of infinite value, infinite worth, and infinite power. And we stop and consider the power of God in the gospel unto salvation. So, Father, help us here as we go through this content, as we look forward to that date in February, that we will be ready to have your eyes to see people that we know, acquaintances that don't know you, that we build relationships with them, that we invite them to come to this event, that they would accept our, our offer in good faith, and that during that evening, your Holy Spirit would take the message, soften their hearts, and they would believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, that's what we're here for, and we ask that you would help us in this endeavor, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So my name is Tim Kieser. I pastored a church for 15 years. That was my third career. I'm on my fourth one now. I'm not sure what my fifth career is going to be, but I got a, I got a decade or so left to figure that out. But I started about a year ago working for the ministry of Leading the Way and Dr. Michael Youssef. Um, he's a pastor of Church of the Apostles in Atlanta. He's done evangelistic work all over the world. This past year, they had evangelistic services in Macon, Georgia in Cairo, Egypt, and in Dublin and Belfast, Ireland. Wanda and I had the good fortune of going to Ireland at the end of August and help with those evangelistic celebrations. A couple years ago, he was at the Moody Center in Northfield, Massachusetts for a pastor's event, and he felt the Lord tugging on his heart to do evangelistic effort here in New England because he's seen the same statistics that you have all seen. If you have your eyes open and watching, we are in the least Christian area of the country the least church area. Um, close second would be the Pacific Northwest. And then if you start ranking the New England states, Maine and Vermont battle for the very bottom of the most unchurched. And guess who's dipping at the heels? New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island and Connecticut. So we are in an area that missiologists would call an unengaged people group. Uh, a, a, the only thing lower than that would be an unreached people group. They've never heard the gospel at all. The next level up would be an unengaged people group. So you are living in a mission field where, where churches and denominations would, would identify even a country in a foreign land and see that the gospel was there once, but it's kind of what, what they say, kind of like the burned over district type of thing. And they would still be investing money to send missionaries into an unreached people group, an unengaged people group, I should say. You're living among an unengaged people group, and we are called to be missionaries. And for several weeks now, many of you have been going through the way of the master that led, was led by Roosevelt, and you've learned about personal soul winning, and that's important. We're called individually to do that. But there is another prong to a two-prong approach. I alluded to it in announcements this morning, and that is proclamation-style evangelistic event. Now, many people think that the age of, of those events that Billy Graham used to do is, is gone. Well, let me here to tell you that's not the case. And the reason is is because it's a biblical approach. Jesus, he spent time giving the kingdom to the one-on-one, -on -one, but he also brought the kingdom in a mass preaching event. Sermon on the Mount will be a perfect example of doing that. So if we're to follow how our master, Jesus, brought the kingdom to people who needed to hear the kingdom, it is in our one-on-one -on -one relationship, sharing our testimony and a witness, but also bringing them to an event. I had a pastor teach me this thought one time. The beauty of an evangelistic event where they just come and sit and hear a preacher is this. They don't have the opportunity to argue Follow me on that. When you're a one-on-one, -on -one, they may want to go back and forth and back and forth. And that, that's okay. We can do that. But when they come and they sit and they just hear a full-throated proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
and a call to repent and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit can shut down their arguments. The Holy Spirit can soften their hearts. They may hear something that they hadn't heard quite that way before, and at that moment, we believe, when they put faith in Jesus, they are born again. They're born anew again. And so um, we have an event coming up. And uh, oh, thank you, it still works, hallelujah. Um, Wednesday, February 21st at 6 p.m. You need to etch that into your calendar. Don't write it in pencil, put it in pen. So you can't erase it. You need to etch this down. It's an opportunity to invite lost people to come to a dinner. Who doesn't like to eat, amen? You know? <laughs> so around that table, they're going to be rubbing shoulders with Christians. They have an opportunity to, to get to know them. There are going to be a, at least two people that are going to share their personal testimony that night. Because the Lord can use someone's testimony to speak into the life of somebody. And this is how it happens. I resonate with that person's story. Their story is my story. I want what they have. And so we're going to have that. And we also have an evangelist coming, a gentleman that has been gifted with the calling of an evangelist to come and preach a message proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ with an opportunity, with an invitation at the end for people to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, what does that have to do with me? There are three things necessary for an evangelistic event to happen and for it to be blessed of God. And these are not contrived. These are not something I made up. This is actually research from the years of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. The material we're going over today was actually BGEA material that's been adapted and adopted by leading the way. There are three necessary things. Pray. Pray. When, when Billy Graham would come to a city and he would talk to all the mobilizers in that city that would be there weeks and months ahead of time before the evangelistic event, he would ask them, people, I want you to pray. And then number two, I want you to pray. And number three, I want you to pray. Without prayer, we, we might as well pack up and go home. That sounds very abrupt, but it's true. Number two is a tool that's this card, and we're going to talk about that today, called Come and See. Come and See. And that is the method by which we are going to ask God to show us people around us in the course of our living day in and day out, co-workers, people that deliver your mail, the teller at the bank, the person who grooms your dog, whoever these people might be that you know and you've got a, kind of a cordial relationship with, but if you built that relationship further and invited them to come, they might come. And so when I said this morning, we want 50% of the people here that night to not know Jesus, I wasn't being facetious and I wasn't losing my mind. The idea is, is this is not a church event for Christians to come and, and be filled in their tummy and filled in their heart. That's going to happen by virtue of coming and hear the gospel. Those that know it well love to hear it again and again, amen? I hope you do. I hope you love hearing the story of Jesus over and over again and still stirs your heart. If it doesn't, then pinch yourself, okay? We want to be stirred. Yes, that's going to happen. But the goal is that people that come to that don't know the Savior. And by the end of that event, they will know the Savior. And so you're going to learn about that tool. And then the last, third, and most important thing is follow-up. Have you ever watched an evangelistic event and they sing just as I am and all those throngs of people move forward to the platform? Have you ever asked yourself, I wonder what became of them after the event? And so when we think of evangelism and discipleship, we need to think of a coin and two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. You can't do evangelism without follow-up and discipleship. And you don't have any follow-up and discipleship if the person isn't evangelized and comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So, so we need to ask the Lord how we individually are going to come alongside a brand new baby in Jesus and walk with them. The church obviously has its responsibility. The church is going to have its classes. The church is going to have worship. But when you have a new baby that comes home from the hospital, 
You don't feed them one meal a day and they're all done, right? They require continual attention. We need to wire in our minds a brand new believer in Jesus Christ is a lot like that newborn baby we just brought home from the hospital. Somebody has got to pay them attention. Somebody has got to be their friend. And so the challenge that I'm issuing you right out of the shoe here today, are you ready to be that person? And so we're going to, next week, we'll talk more about those tools of how we can come alongside a brand new believer. But today, we're going to be talking about um, the Christian's witness, your witness and your walk. And then if you've been going through um, some of the uh, training that's already been offered, some of this will be a little redundant. That's okay. Repetition is a good thing. And perhaps there'll be some other tools here uh, that you have not heard of before. Our key verse for this whole training is 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15, which is always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have. But do this in gentleness and respect. At the very beginning verse, before those words, he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Revere Christ as Lord. Or some translations have revere as honor Christ as Lord. And so revere means set apart, sanctify, make holy. So we need to set a place of Christ in our heart where he has us, where he's got a hold of us. Amen? That, that we're setting apart our lives for his service to do his bidding. I know many of us are doing that already, but I've learned this, and perhaps you have too. It's a daily choice, isn't it? We wake up and we swing those feet out of the bed on a morning, and we've got to make that choice again. Today, Lord, I'm going to look for opportunities to honor and revere you in my heart. It says that we need to be always prepared, always prepared. <laughs> That means you need to be ready at a moment's notice to tell someone the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because opportunities will present themselves that if you're not ready, will pass by. And it's conceivable that person may never hear the gospel again because that was your opportunity. Now that isn't to, to, to scare us into obedience, but that's just the reality. Because as we learned in the sermon today, Expiration date is unknown for any of us, right? And that moment, so we've got to be ready at a moment's notice to do that, like a fire brigade ready to go. And it says, the hope, the gospel is the hope this world needs. Can I get an amen? amen. I pretty much in my 56 years, that was my turning point yesterday, I've pretty much given up on every other tool human beings have to offer to bring hope in this world. And that isn't being a cynic, I'm just being a realist, because there is only one hope, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the only hope, because he solves the three greatest threats to our life. Sin, death, and the devil. There's a trifecta that's trying to destroy every single human being around us today. Sin, death, and the devil. And only one man destroyed all three, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that's hope, because people are struggling under the burden of those things. And so we think of that. And then I have a story I want to share with you briefly. You may know the story of Edward Kimball. Does anyone know the story of Edward Kimball? Well, I hope his obscurity was, was not wasted here this morning, because I think you probably didn't. In 1858, Edward Kimball was a young Sunday school teacher. And uh, he uh, had the habit of giving his... Uh, his message of his witness and the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone. And he was concerned about one of the students in his class that worked at a local shoe store. And one day Kimball visited the young man at the store and found him in the back stocking the shelves in the back room. And he led that young man to Christ. That young man was Dwight L. Moody. You've probably heard the name D.L. Moody before. Moody became an international speaker and he toured the British Isles and he preached in a little chapel pastored by a young pastor named F.B. Mayer or Frederick Brotherton Mayer. In his sermon, he told the story of the Sunday school teacher that had won him to Jesus. 
And that inspired Mayer to, to be an evangelist like Moody. And he came to America. He came to Northfield, Massachusetts, and he started preaching. And one day Mayer was preaching, if you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? And that message got a hold of a young man named J. Wilbur Chapman. And J. Wilbur Chapman responded to God's call in his life to be a preacher of the gospel. And he became an evangelist. And he enlisted this young man that was up and coming in the evangelical world by the name of Billy Sunday. Anybody ever heard of the evangelist Billy Sunday? And Billy Sunday uh, started to serve. And then when Chapman retired from the scene, Billy Sunday took over his evangelist campaign. And um, Billy Sunday... Uh, did a crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, and many men started dedicating their lives at this evangelistic event to the proclamation of the gospel. And one of those evangelists was a man named Mordecai Ham, and he started holding a series of evangelistic messages. The year was 1932, and a, a local farmer loaded up his pickup truck, because you could ride in the back of pickup trucks back then without seatbelts. They've taken all that fun away today. And you could do that, and there was one 16-year-old boy in the crowd that went that night, and he heard the gospel, and he gave his life to Jesus, and that young man was Billy Graham. You see the chain here? And Billy Graham communicated the gospel to more people than any other person in history. Follow that chain back to some guy you've never heard of before, Edward Kimball, because he was faithful to share the gospel. I share this story. Not because I don't want you to become evangelists and go on the circuit here, you know. <laughs> but you, when you share the gospel with somebody and they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, you could create a chain reaction you could be totally unaware of. You change the life of a person, but the domino effect is beyond anything you could ever fathom. We see consistently, for instance, in the book of Acts, whole households coming to faith in Jesus Christ. You could share with a mom and a dad that has a whole family, and because that mom or dad or both become Christians, their whole family gives their life to Jesus Christ. We should be praying in expectation that's what's going to happen here at Emmanuel Church. And I don't say that as a pep talk. I say that as this is the way our Lord works. He loves to save people from their sins. And he loves to take entire families and change their lives. So I encourage you, what we're embarking on here is powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And so let's go through some tips for witnessing here this morning. Some things that I want you to consider. And it's page 20 in the book, and you can uh, write in the blank if you want to. If you miss anything, here's a little, here's a little tip. All the answers are in the back of the book. I love books like that. <laughs> so you can go in later. And we're starting at session two, and we're doing session two and three because I wanted to condense this into two weeks for the sake of time. The first session, you can go do yourself if you want to. And it's just a walk. It's just a walk of strengthening your walk, a walk through how to strengthen your own walk with the Lord. So go ahead and do session two on your own. But we're, we're focusing on sessions two and three. So we need to uh, be, uh, be, know that we are called. When Jesus gave his great commission, it wasn't just for those disciples. When he said, go into all the world, and preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them everything that I've taught you. And he said, lo, I am with you to the end of the age. When you're involved in gospel ministry, do you know the Holy Spirit is with you? The, you're, not, you're not sharing the weather report for the day to somebody. You're sharing content that the Holy Spirit has inspired. And it has power. It has power. Know that you are called. Think like a missionary. Somebody tell me, how does a missionary think? Anybody want to just, how, well, how does a missionary think? Anybody want to take a stab at that? How does a missionary think? They see every person as a po possibility to be a new believer in Jesus Christ, right? They also think of strategies. How do I connect? 
You just had 12 weeks of amazing strategies in the way of a master. Ways to turn conversations around, way to befriend people, way to be kind to somebody. Missionaries think that way. We must emphasize God's love. This is the primary message of the entire Bible. God loves us. For God so that he that whosoever say it, should not but have everlasting life. It's the very essence of the Bible that God is love and he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to have a relationship. Number four, and I'm on page 20 again, you need to take a direct route to Christ. A direct route to Christ. And this is important. People like to talk about God. You say, no, they don't. Well, they do. <laughs> and, and they have some a semblance of somewhere what they think God is like. You know, let me give you a little tip. Usually their notion of God is not a biblical notion of God. It's not true, you know. Uh, he's not up there with a, with, a, with a laser gun ready to zap everyone that messes up. That's not the picture of the Bible. But that isn't to say that he's not a God of wrath and judgment because he's holding that off right now. But if you can move the discussion to Jesus, because Jesus is the exact representation of God, and you can bring the discussion to who Jesus is and what he has done, then they get a picture of who God really is. And that's important. We've got to get talking about Jesus. Talk about your personal story. The beautiful thing about your personal story is no one can refute it. It's your story. And our whole culture is wired that way. Your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. While I don't agree with that notion, I believe there is one truth. I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. I believe in the exclusivity of the gospel because Jesus said, no one can come to the Father but through me, he said. But our culture thinks there are many paths. Okay, tell me your story. And now I'm going to tell you my story. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few moments. Your story can be very powerful. How did you come to faith in Jesus Christ, and what does he mean to you? People just can't argue with that. Now, that isn't total evangelism, but it is the beginning of it. People, not only that, are wired for story. We love stories. That's why the entertainment business is so huge, and theater is so huge, and literature is so huge. God has made us wired for story. Guess what? Most of the Bible is narrative. It's story, right? It's story. And so tell yours. Keep it simple. Okay, you ought to be able to tell the gospel in two minutes. Really. It, 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 you, know, you, don't, you don't need to start in Genesis and work your way through every book of the Bible to tell the gospel. You know? In fact, the gospel in a nutshell, if you just take it, I actually saw a preacher put a, a series of sermons together called Gospel in a Nutshell, and he preached for four weeks on one verse, John 3.16. For God. That was the first sermon. So loved. That was the second sermon, you know? Literally, that one verse. Why is it so well known? Why is it so preached? Because that is the gospel in a nutshell. Keep it simple. Be willing to listen. We like to talk a lot. Sometimes we've got to be quiet. Hear their story. Because in their story, they'll divulge some things with you in confidence and in true friendship that the gospel will speak to. The gospel will speak to. So these are the things that we want to be involved with. Not keeping up with this very well. Be willing to listen. Pray for an open door. Someone read that for me, nice and loud. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear to you how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So if our first memory verse that I'm challenging with is the theme of the course, 1 Peter 3.15, this is number two. This is a scripture to memorize, but this is scripture to pray. <coughs> to pray as we go about our daily routines and daily lives, we want to pray, as it were, for an open door. Paul 
almost said that. I want an open door. Now, what do I mean by open door? I want the Holy Spirit to create situations where I can start to talk to somebody and they're talking to me. And then through that, 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 that discussion, we can move it beyond whether politics, you know, the, the mundane of living to something eternal. Something eternal. Pray for that open door. And along with that, we need to pray for an open heart. So as I go out, Lord, give me an open door, and then that person would have an open heart. Open heart to what? To receive what I want to share with them. To receive me. To receive me. I, I remember a song lyric from the 90s, going back a ways, by Jeff Moore. He says, I will live to tell of the one who has rescued my heart. I will live to tell of the one who can bring a new start. Take my life and let it be a reflection of you for the whole world to see. Because God is alive and well, I will live to tell. So we check our witness, too. We check the way we're behaving, our attitudes, our actions, or an open heart. And then we also want to look for open, open mouths. I don't know what to say. Have you ever said that to yourself? I don't know what to say. Okay. That's a good prayer. Holy Spirit, I don't know what to say. Empty yourself and let him fill you with what to say. And what you need to say is obviously his word. So the challenge is, how does he feed us with what to say? Get into his word. Get into his word. I am, I'm called on, even now, after uh, kind of my post-church pastoral thing, I'm still called on because I'm an ordained minister to do funerals. And, and, and I usually preach on the same text every funeral, whether it's a believer, a non-believer. I've, I've done funerals of suicide. I've done funerals of overdoses. I've done funerals in backyards. I've done funerals in churches and graveside. I've been called in the toughest situations where I realize I am probably the only believer in this situation, but somehow they felt like they needed a minister there to, to, to do something, you know? And I found my saying, Lord, what do I do? And I know there's, there's at least two verses, in, uh, pieces of the Bible that people probably recognize. One we've aforementioned, John 3.16. Number two is the 23rd Psalm. Most everyone knows that's a gospel psalm. Because the very end of that psalm, David makes a declaration that's the most bold, audacious statement anyone in the Bible could ever make. He said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The guy was an adulterer and conspired to have the man's wife killed. <laughs> That's about as heinous of a sin as I could possibly think of. <laughs> Yet he had, he had the audacity to say, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How could he say that? Because he knew the shepherd. He knew the shepherd. And the shepherd was the one who brought him forgiveness. When he repented, he knew he was forgiven. Doesn't that play in this world today? So, so get, get re-familiar with some verses that other people might be re-familiar with, right? They may already know. I, I, will, I will quote the 23rd Psalm in the King James Version, and I'll see lips moving, you know? Usually by old people. <laughs> They've heard it. And I've got them, because the beauty of that Psalm, but it's a gospel Psalm. So saturate yourself with little pieces like that. You could lead someone through that, and they could come to know Jesus Christ from something they've heard for, for ages but never knew what it meant. But you took the time to go through that. So you pray for the open mouths, what to say. So personal testimony is very powerful. And I've talked about the power of that already is because people really can't argue with your testimony. It's your story, right? This is what happened. They can't argue with it. But, but your story is you're thinking about your personal testimony, and here's a little heads up. I'm going to give you homework. Is it like homework? Hallelujah. Look at the enthusiasm from the audience. When, when I say homework, I'm like, I didn't sign up for that, Pastor Tim. Sorry. It's entirely voluntary. It's entirely up to you. But have you ever written on one side of one piece of paper your testimony? Well, why do you want to only be one side of one piece of paper? Because you need to be concise. You may only have a few moments with that person. Don't give them a five-page, you know, single space, ten font, five-page, you know. They ain't got time for that, okay? They ain't got time for that. And in this world, it's fast-paced and crazy. They get time for that. Have you ever just taken the time to what? 
what was my life before Christ? I have one word for mine, empty. <laughs> Think of what one word, and I challenge you that, what is the one word that would describe your life before Christ? It could be lonely, empty, sad, discouraged, confused. I mean, and, and you, those words, guess what? Immediately that person, you've got that person. Why? Because they've experienced the exact same thing. Because we're all sinners in need of a savior. We're all in the same place. How I became a follower of Jesus. How did you hear about Jesus? Was it a friend? Was it a church? Was it a youth event? Was it a crusade? Was it a TV show, a radio broadcast? How did you, how did you hear the gospel? Oh, what did you hear about Jesus? Okay. I mean, I, I shared, um, I think, I, I forget where I share these stories. <laughs> I think it was at the men's uh, breakfast yesterday. I, I worked, I worked uh, as a volunteer with Child Evangelism Fellowship of Southern Maine. And I worked the Good News tent at Acton Fair a number of years ago. And I had this little boy here, and I was going through the wordless book, and I was trying to connect Jesus. And I saw a lot of blank stares. This poor little boy was bewildered. He had no idea what he was talking about. So I'm like, I'm scrambling. Okay, so I brought, well, you know Christmas time, the birth of Jesus. And he looks straight at me, and he says, Santa Claus is what Christmas is all about. He shut me down. <laughs> 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 he shut me down for a second. My eyes were open. The Holy Spirit revealed something to me. This little boy's understanding was not an exception. It was the rule. We have a whole generation that are growing up around us. They think Jesus Christ is a swear word. That should break our hearts. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his holy name. And remember that chorus? That's the reason why I love him so, because Jesus is the sweetest name I know. How are they gonna know? Unless we set the record straight, this is who Jesus is. The world does not know who Jesus is. Do not assume the person that you're around with all the time knows anything about who Jesus really is. Assume that they don't. I know we live in America and we think that's not the case, but we've, it's changed, it has changed. But we can, change, we can make a change, amen? Yeah. Because the, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And we can be the change with the power of that. So what, was my, what was, has my life been since? What is the difference he's made in my life? You know? Forgiveness of sin is huge, amen? Yeah. Burdens, I'm going to quote a lot of hymns today because I do that because I grew up in the church and hymnody is like second nature to me. But there's an old hymn, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. How's it go? Jesus is very near, very near. What was the burdens like? Hallelujah. So there's another thing called a guided discussion. So after you've had a chance to do that, you should have a little tract in there. And this tract came from Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I want to walk through this quickly this morning. So something you can do is, is a tract is a good thing. There's a lot of tracks out there. I, I kind of singled this one out. Leading the Way kind of uses this one. This has also been used for years by Billy Graham because they developed it. Steps of Peace with God. Steps of Peace with God. See, that title alone resonates with me because if this world is lacking something, it's lacking peace, right? Yeah. Turmoil all around us all the time. And people are longing for some kind of stability. Peace is stability. So we can, we can walk through this kind of quickly together. Right? cognizant of the time, but the first question, and the first thing it directs you toward is understand God's purpose, peace, and eternal life. And in Romans 5.1 it says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.16, obviously familiar with that. John 10.10, 10, I, I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. God wants to give us abundant life, and that's not just in the sweet by and by. That's starting today. Because when you have peace with God, you have the entrance to an abundant life because you are no longer at war with your maker. Amen? Amen. So we've, we've worked through that. Number two, admit the problem, our sin and separation. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. And people have tried many ways to bridge this gap between themselves and God. We have come up with all kinds of ways. False religion. Trying to outweigh the balance. I'll do enough good and that will offset the bad, right? 
I'm a good person, I'm better than that person over there. <laughs> By whose standard are you better than that person over there? You see, people think this way all the time. We have to come to the point that says, well, I'm a human being, you're a human being. I've sinned. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, if you just look with your eye in lust, you've already committed a pretty heinous sin, right? You know? if, I, if I'm angry at my neighbor for no reason, I've already. So the thoughts and intents of our heart, things that go through our mind that we never put into action, God sees it. And so when we come to a realization ourselves, we realize, yeah, I got a problem. I got a problem. Well, this solution is number three. Discover God's bridge, the cross. The Bible says there is one God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5. And Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3.18. And you can see the rest of the scriptures there. You just take the time and walk the person through this. Walk the through, person through this. And number four, embrace the truth. Receive Christ. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and him to me. I am the way, the truth, and the light, Jesus said. No one comes through the Father except through me. And the Bible says, To all who did receive him, who believed his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And who believes in the Son has eternal life. And so a tool that you can use is something like this. we got a whole bunch of them in the back if you want to collect more on the way home. After you've kind of got this conversation going along with a the person, they've heard your testimony, I'm not suggesting you go testimony, then to this. And then this, we're not using uh, an automatic weapon here <laughs> in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot of times a person needs a little bit, and they need to chew in it a little bit. So if that's someone you see all the time and they've heard your witness, in the witness they've heard the gospel already if you've done it right. But then it gives them a taste for a little bit more. A taste for a little bit more. It's like Lay's potato chips. Remember Lay's potato chips commercial? It used to say you can't eat just... Yeah, I, I tried to give up potato chips at the beginning of the year. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing as good as I should. Confession here this morning. I, I love potato chips, but I need, I need to get rid of them in my life. Um, they're not doing me any good. But your witness is going to give them a taste. And then, then take the time. Hey, can I tell you a little bit more about this? This is simple. Simple way to share the gospel. Remember, your job is not to get someone to say a sinner's prayer. Your job is to give them the gospel. And the Holy Spirit will take that and soften their hearts. And they will start asking you. I want what you have. And if you're somewhat emotional like I am, you'll probably burst into tears at that point. That God would choose to use me in this situation. This is the other exciting thing about soul winning. That's a lot like Lay's potato chips. When you say, when you lead someone to the Lord, when you bring the gospel, and right before your very eyes, they believe in the gospel and they're born again. You're going to want more of that. Seriously, you're going to be like, because you're going to be exhilarated. Okay, and and then then think about what that does to a church. You know, if if we if we have Say, say, I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna be conservative. Say we get 50 people to come that night that don't know Jesus. And 25 of them respond to the gospel. There are 25 new believers now coming next Sunday to Emmanuel Church to worship. Do you think things are exciting here now? I do. Do you think things would get even more exciting and full of joy in the house of the Lord when that happens? Yes. Yes. I mean. When I brought our firstborn home from the hospital, I was excited. Grammy and Grandpa and Nana, they were excited. The neighbors down the street were excited because, hey, there's a new baby in the Keyser household. Did anyone ever experience that with new birth? It's exciting. Why would we not expect the same thing when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ that once was lost and now was found? And we celebrate that. That's why what we're doing on the 21st is not a campaign. It's, a, it's an evangelistic celebration. It's a celebration of the gospel that we call come and see. How am I doing on time? I have no idea. One o'clock. How do you have to keep moving again? So we went through this. And again, I've got to play catch up here. 
There's another thing you can do, and it's in your book. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna work through this fairly expeditiously, but this is another tool that you can walk someone through, and it's called the cross illustration. And, and it's around these points here, and you'll find it in your book, is that God has a plan, it's peace and life. We have a problem, we're separating from our creator God. Number three, there's a remedy, it's the cross. And number four, receive Christ. Very simple, very simple thing. And then you can see the scripture references there. And, and, and either have them printed out and for you or have your Bible there. I think it's always important when you're sharing the gospel with someone after your testimony, have a Bible there. Show them that's what this says. Now, they may say, well, I don't believe in the Bible. Well, then why should they believe in you either? At least the Bible is the inspired word of God, right? And, and because it's the inspired word of God, it's powerful. And you can say, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm showing you here, this is what the Bible says. And, and sometimes sharing the gospel with somebody is kind of a take it or leave it kind of thing. Again, you're just responsible to get content to them in love. It's the Holy Spirit's job to take the content and sink it into their soul. So take the pressure off yourself, you know? Because some people are going to say, I don't want that. Okay. Don't give up on them. Don't stop praying for them. And still be their friend. Christian, this, this, this afternoon, how many non-believers would you consider a good friend of yours? I found something as, as, as we grow up in the church, as we walk with the Lord for a while, it's very easy for us to kind of put ourselves in kind of the Bible bubble, the church cocoon, where all of the people that we hang out with and all the people we have friends with are all Christians. And we really stop thinking about those who are not in the church and those who don't know Jesus. We don't do it intentionally. We just do it because that's just kind of the way we float through and move into. We should have friends that are non-believers. Not that they're influencing us with the world, but that we're influencing them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, there's a danger of having so many friends that they're influencing you away from that. But as Christians, we're called to be influencers. Isn't that the big buzzword now? People are making a living by being a social influencer on social media now. I'd rather be an influencer with the gospel of Jesus Christ than anything else. How about you? Uh, I don't care about what detergent you use to clean your clothes, quite honestly. I mean, God bless you for whatever you use, whether it's pods or liquid, I don't care. But I do want you to know, do you know who Jesus is? And it's your choice. Take him or leave him. But you can't do nothing with Jesus. He demands a response. You've got to receive him or reject him. There's no neutrality with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will change it in a person's heart. And so we kind of work through, you can do this little chart in your book here, where you've got people in God. If, if you're a graphical person, some people are very good at pictures. And, and you obviously, here's, here's the things that you kind of put together in there. And there's a gulf, obviously, between us and God. That's the point of the picture in the middle. Um, and then we have attempts, our works, our religion, our morality, and that doesn't work, and that doesn't work, and morality doesn't work. None of those things are going to bridge the gap. They all fall short. But we need to help a person understand that. All those things are going to fall short. But God has a remedy. Thank God for the cross. Now, I know that crosses are on buildings where they may not be the gospel preached anymore. I understand that. It's epidemic in New England. But I got to tell you personally, if I see a cross wherever I'm at in the world, I still see it as a symbol of hope. I still see it as a symbol of hope. There's a reason why people wear it around their neck. It's just, it just has, has this universal symbol of hope uh, because that's the remedy. So where are you? You ask the person, where are you? in this situation. Are you, on, are you on the left side and you're trying to get over to the other side or not? So you can, you can walk them through this here. The idea is we want to bring that person across to the other side with their faith <coughs> in Jesus Christ. So if you find someone's more visual, there's another, there's another tool that we can go through. <coughs> All right. All right, we got to get to this because this is, this is the biggest important piece you could possibly have. 
find that card that says come and see. And actually, that's what we're calling this event. Come and see. So remember I said prayer is number two. I mean, number one. Prayer is number one for, for a successful, for the lack of a better term, a blessed event. Maybe that's a better. Number two is come and see. And then we'll talk about number three next week. So if no lost people come to the event, we'll have a nice meal and hear a good sermon and go home. Okay. <laughs> I would love to see people up here crying out to Jesus. And you people right behind them with a hand on their shoulder praying for them. And giving them a hug, welcome into the kingdom of God. And saying and, and, and being encouraging them and being a cheerleader for them, and weeping with them, and jumping up and down in joy for them because they were lost and now they're found. I would love to see God do that. If God should so bless us by his spirit, that could be a, a prolonged time at the altar where God just continues to work on hearts that night and people respond. Some people are stubborn, did you know that? <laughs> you say, Pastor, I am one, hallelujah. No, no, no. But when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, he's not going to let go. Mm. We pray that people will say yes. So there are five steps to, to, to this, and it's based off the scripture in the beginning of John. When you read the beginning of John's gospel, many of the disciples are saying, we found the master. And, 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 and they're like, okay, come and see, come and see. We get down to Nathaniel, the story of Nathaniel. And, and uh, I believe it's Andrew, if I'm not mistaken, it's Andrew, that I, we found the Savior. And Nathaniel says, can anything good, remember that, come out of Nazareth, okay? And Dr. Youssef, he, he keyed in on this here because, because Nathaniel is the skeptic. You got any skeptics around you at all? You know? They're everywhere. You bump into them all the time. And Nathaniel's a skeptic. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then Andrew says, simple as this, just Come and see. He doesn't evangelize him. He doesn't give him the, the, any, any scripture. He just says, come and see for yourself. Come and meet the master. Now, we don't believe that Jesus is physically going to show up here on the 21st. Okay? But through the power of the gospel, spiritually, he is going to be here. So when we're asking someone to come and see, ultimately we're not having to come and see a plate of food before them. Or come and see the fellowship around the table. Or come and see even the testimonies. Or come and see the preacher. They're coming to hear a message. And in the message, they're going to meet Jesus. So we want them here so that they will hear. As I read at the announcements this morning, how will they believe if they don't hear, right? Yeah. And, and how will they hear if someone isn't sent to preach to them, right? So we will create this environment where they will be able to hear a pure proclamation of the gospel. So when we say come and see, we want them to come and see. And so this is a prayer tool for you. And you will see there's 10 slots on there. We just kind of arbitrarily picked 10. You're going to pray, Lord, show me someone in my day-to-day -day living. It might be a good friend. It might be a neighbor. It might be a cousin. It might be the person who delivers your mail, grooms your dog, cuts your hair. That you're pretty sure they are not a believer in Jesus Christ. And you put their name on here. And then you put the name on the other side and there's a tear off here. We're going to collect those shortly in, in the weeks ahead. Kind of collect those. So as a church, we're praying for all of these cards with names on them. And then you start praying for that person. And then you'll see this slip of paper here that says here, and it says, come and see prayer prompts. You'll say, how do I pray? We've already given you the prayers. Pull this out in the prayers, and if you flip it over, it gives you people that are you bump into day in and day out that you may not even have thought of that ought to be, that ought to be coming to this event and responding to your message. So prayers like, Lord, break my heart for the things that break your heart. I believe... It breaks God's heart when people try to bring comfort into their life through addiction. I believe it breaks God's heart. I believe it breaks God's heart when there's little boys like the one at Acton Fair that doesn't even know who Jesus is. 
thinks Christmas is only about Santa. I think that breaks God's heart. I think, it, well, you, you, you add the list to it. And you say, Lord, soften my heart. You know, uh, one thing that I was taught by pastors and seminary and all that, there but for the grace of God go I. I'm thankful I was born into a Christian home. And at the age of eight, I accepted Christ. And at the age of 16, 40 years ago, I went through the baptismal waters. I was spared a lot of things that people from my generation have not been spared of by way of addiction. That does not mean I'm sinless. But some of those decisions that we make that can destroy our lives, I was spared of that. And I thank God for that. But there are a lot of people that have, they have a story. Boy, do they have a story. And until they meet Jesus, God's heart's breaking for them. Should our hearts break for them as well? that they could literally have their story line rewritten through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you're going to ask the Lord, show me, put those names on there, duplicate it. We're going to tear that off at some point. We're going to collect it as collectively as a church. We're going to pray for those names. If you fill this card up, we got more. Hallelujah. <laughs> we can do more. And maybe you only have two or three names on there. That's okay. If the Lord only gives you two or three names, then you're going to have laser focused on some people that you're going to build a relationship with and have them come. And, and you might do it this way. It's just a suggestion. Okay? First of all, people like free food. Amen? Amen. The service is in the middle of the week. Don't have to cook a meal in the middle of the week. I like that idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not only that is they may know that you're some kind of church goer, at least, right? That you go to that church there at Eastern Avenue, Emmanuel, and they kind of know what's going on. And they and you can say, listen, you know I'm a Christian. Have you ever wondered why I believe what I believe? Well, we're going we're gonna to learn about that at this dinner. Why don't you just come? I mean, people come for dinners for lesser things than that. I mean, people come to, come to meetings to learn how to find snowmobile trails and, 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 and how, to, how to fly fish and, you know, and, and how, to, how, to, you know, how to take care of animals. I mean, they, they come for other things, these type of banquets, to, to learn, okay? Just come on a Wednesday night and come with me, and you'll get a free meal. You get to hang out with me. Maybe you shouldn't say that. Maybe they don't like you. I don't know. Maybe they don't want to hang out with you. I don't know. Well, you get to hang out and meet my friend who's really cool, right? You know? I'll let you work that out. But, but they're going to be confronted with the gospel. And when I say confronted, I don't mean in a, oh, we're going to come after them with hellfire and brimstone. No. A confrontation just means truth is going to come to them. And then they're going to have to say, am I going to continue to believe the lies I believe in? Or am I going to believe that that's true? And we trust that they will believe in that truth. This is, this, is, this is like the heart of this whole thing. If we don't do this, okay, then we're going to have a nice meal. And we'll have a nice fellowship and we'll go home. But the only way we're going to get lost people is by inviting them. Here's a stat that I want you to hold on to. This is one of the most amazing statistics you'll ever hear. Here. 100% of the people you bring will be here. <laughs> I want to give you another run at it. 100% of the people you bring will be here. Okay? Now, I know, Pastor, you've been really facetious now, and it's late, and we need to go home, and you're saying things like that. They won't come if they're not invited. Okay, we could, we could plaster this all over town and all the social media. People generally don't wake up that morning and say, I think I want to hear a preacher tonight tell me about the gospel. They don't. They come because someone said, I really would love you to come with me. I really love you to come with me. And I care about you as enough as a friend, an acquaintance. That this is just important to me. Would you, would you, would you just make my day? And come with me. Hallelujah. You know, the worst thing that can happen, this is the worst thing. They say no. And they're still your friend. This, guys, there's no risk here. <laughs> there's no risk in doing this. And, and I, know, I know the personal evangelism and going out into the streets and sharing the gospel for a lot of us, that is the most petrifying thing in the world. I'm actually, I'm actually giving you the opportunity to lower the bar a little bit. We can do this. We can invite someone. And the best thing that could happen 
they say yes. And you're going to be like, hallelujah. And you're praying for them. The church is praying for them. I mean, all of heaven is going to be bombarded with prayer for this person. I believe prayer changes things. And one of the most powerful things that can change is the human heart to receive the gospel. And then if you're a friend and you've gone through this training, you're going to be able to walk down here with them. And you're going to be able to love on them when they come to faith in Jesus Christ. You will get to be their encourager. You will get to be their encourager. And so we encourage you to do that. When, when the event happens, we're not asking you to sit there as your friend goes forward. This training is means you're going to be ready to go forward with them. And if it's two, then you get in the middle of two of them. If it's three, then form a little, a little circle. But you're going to be able to walk them again. Do you understand what the preacher is saying here tonight? Do you understand that you're a sinner? Do you understand that Jesus is it? You're going to walk them through that again so that they know what they're doing, right? We, there's a lot of emotion sometimes when people come to faith in Jesus Christ, but we don't want it to be an entirely emotional event. Because some people, they just go off of emotion. It's like the seed that falls on the ground and quickly withers away. They, they really didn't know what they're doing. So it's going to be your job to clarify the decision that they're making that night. And then next week you'll learn about discipleship and those things you get to do. Is this still working? So we kind of walked through that, that story. We want to get intentional about rescuing people. You're going to pray. You're going to build relationships. You're going to invite. You're going to encourage. And you're going to follow up. And here's your home study. Here's your home study. I want you to begin looking at some of these memory verses. They're right in the back of your book. Matter of fact, you can tear them out of your back and book and put them on your refrigerator door, you know? Because I look at my refrigerator door a lot. How about you? <laughs> the Lay's potato chips are not in the refrigerator, though. I know that much. Hallelujah. <laughs> Write out. Take some time this week on one piece of paper, 8 and a half by 11, one side. Type it right at your testimony. Write it down. And, and don't write around and throw it away. Just write it down. Get it kind of clear in your mind, your, where you were, where you are now. Pray for God to open a door for you to share the gospel even this week. We don't have to wait till the 21st of February to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And we're not telling you, we're going to go to all this, but I don't want you to do anything until the 21st. No, if, if the Lord gives you an opportunity to share the gospel, do it then, right? Still invite them, that's okay, you know? Maybe they'll bring some friends. They'll, because a brand new Christian is so excited about the, call, about the gospel. There's nothing more exciting to be around than a brand new Christian. Because no one told them yet how hard it is to be a Christian. You know? <laughs> they're excited. And the truth is real. And they're full of zeal. And they will probably want to have their friends come to this event. Because they're going to be washed clean inside. And there's nothing like the cleanliness that Christ brings. Amen? Pray that the Lord will give you names for the come and see and work on them. Comments or questions here tonight, this afternoon? Comments or questions? Thoughts? Okay, are you excited? Yes. I know, I know I'm a little enthusiastic. I'm sorry about that, but no, I'm not. But, but this is tremendous. And I just want to close with this. And I, and I say this, no one's paying me to say this. Okay, no one's paying me to say this. And I'm not saying this to score points with anybody. It's, it's, it is my earnest heart. I've, I've, I've pastored church, and I've been to a lot of churches, and I've done training with Tom Rainer in church revitalization and church replanting. I've done a lot of things. And in my job now, I get to visit a lot of churches and, and of all types and all that. And um, the Lord wants to birth his children, his new babies, into healthy places. And healthy places. And if there ever was a church in this vicinity that is ready health-wise to receive new babies, it's Emmanuel Church here in Rochester. And so we cannot lose that thought and, and squander that opportunity, right? That this church is a healthy church and God wants new babies in a healthy place so they can grow. And so the Lord wants to bless this church, I truly believe, with new births in Jesus Christ. And finding lost people in Rochester, New Hampshire is not hard. <laughs> 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 
they're everywhere. They're all over. And they could come here and have their entire eternity changed. That's powerful stuff. So I encourage you, go forth, build relationships and do that. Next week, we will talk about the care of a new believer. The care of a new believer. Because our job doesn't stop at conversion. We have a job as Christians to make disciples. And we have a job to bring new, new believers under our wing and to help them along. We're going to learn about that. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And I thank you for these brothers and sisters in front of me. I thank you for their attentiveness. I thank you for uh, their, their excitement and joy. What a wonderful cross-section of this church that's ready to see God do something immeasurably more than we could ever ask or think. That we could ever dream in our own mind, in our own heart, Lord. You, you could do this here by bringing revival into this vicinity called the Greater Rochester area. If you are so inclined, Lord, and we are so humble to receive, here at Emmanuel Church, here on Easter Avenue. I pray, Lord God, that you would do a work in our hearts to see people as you see them, someone who's lost that can be found, someone who's on a path of eternal destruction that can go on the path of eternal life. And if we give them content, you can take that content and change a heart that they would be born again, born anew. Father, help us in that endeavor. Help us even those that are going to continue the way of the master and going out and evangelizing on the street. All these tactics that we're using, Lord, they're of you, and we ask for you to bless them, and we are ready for the harvest, Lord. We are ready for the harvest. So help us, Lord, to receive that. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all.